With over 35 years of ministry, Mount Zion Church is located in Clarkston, Michigan. You may have seen us while driving an I-75 just north of Great Lakes Crossing. We invite you today to join us as we go inside to hear a fresh and relevant word in this new day. Mount Zion, helping you experience the best life. God is calling us to take a step of faith that we would know him in a way that we never have before. And one of the people that saw this was a man who was in great bondage. And when they saw, and when he saw the power of God, his life was changed. Most of the people believed in him. And so when he gets baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like, wow, it's kind of like a celebrity conversion. People get excited when a famous person comes to the Lord. And, and, and that's what they would have all felt. Wow, can you believe it? There is not just a move of God among us, but here this great man that astonished us, he's found the Lord too. So it was a very exciting visitation that they were all a part of. Now carrying it a step farther in this next verse of scripture, it says that Simon, after having seen the people lay hands on people, seeing them receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, he said, give me this power also that anyone and whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now they say to him, you have neither part nor portion, and I want to emphasize in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness. Pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound in iniquity or doing the wrong thing. Now, what I want you to notice in this scripture is Simon was a person, as you read in the context of it all, received the gospel, believed the gospel. He was baptized, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But now he sees something that he wants to do. And they say, you can't have any part in this matter. Now, the important reason I wanted to point that out is because they weren't saying, you're not a Christian. Look how you're responding. What's the matter with you? But they told him there was a part he couldn't obtain because there was something in his heart. Experience in the past had poisoned him with bitterness. I mean, you know, oftentimes we have experiences in the past that we carry with us. And because of that, he was also bound in iniquity. Now, this is a very important concept because basically they're saying, you're not ready for leadership. You're not ready to get in this level of ministry. You got to do something more about what's going on in your heart. Now, as Christians, we should all understand, and this is why our relationship with God has to be progressive, that even after we repent, are baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, sometimes circumstances, situations just like this one, can reveal something that's in our heart, something that's in our life that God's saying to us, you need to deal with this. That's why at Mount Zion, we have our life enrichment classes that we ask people to consider whenever they're available because sometimes in our Christian experience, we have things that have us bound. Sometimes we have bitter roots inside of us that, well, they just come back, come back, and all the time they're struggling. I want you to know something. The Bible says that the anointing that was upon Christ is also upon each and every one of us. And Jesus said, the anointing of God is upon me. The Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the opening of prison to them that are bound. Can you say amen to that? To, to heal and bind up broken hearts, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy, and, and the garment of praise. I tell you, God wants to do amazing things for us, church. We got to keep on moving, amen? We got to say, God, I'm going to let you give me whatever it is that you have for me, because there's an ongoing progression, because Jesus said, I didn't just come to make you alive, I have come to give you the abundant life. And because of that, we must be always careful to tend to our heart, tend to our life. And he said to him, you need to repent. That means you need a change of mind. You need a change of attitude in your heart here. This next verse of scripture confirms that in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, Lest any root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person 
Like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. That would fall under the heading that I talked about last week where people are not able to delay gratification. This is why we, we should be so glad that the Lord gives us the opportunity to have the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And, and we should say, Lord, I want that fruit because I want that self-control. I want that love. I want that peace. I want that joy. I want all the things that you have for me. Amen? That should always be our attitude and our heart. Now, in order for us to do that, we have to what? Pursue peace with all people. Now, we have to understand that sometimes we have relationship problems. Anybody found that to be the case? The Bible says, follow peace or pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. We're talking here about the Bible declaring to us there's an ongoing walk that we should walk with him. There's an ongoing self-appraisal that we should be willing to make and always an ongoing desire to have everything that God has for us, knowing that if we'll deal with those bitter roots, if we'll deal with those things that are inside of us, we can have the fullness that God has. Otherwise, as I mentioned, this is the principle of fruitfulness. If there's a root in the ground and you just let it grow, you need to deal with it or else it's going to bear fruit in your life. There's a pattern we have to follow if we want to have peace with all men. The Bible says be angry, but sin not. How many know sometimes things make us mad? How many know sometimes people make us mad? Come on, raise your hand. I want you to get into this with me today. You might be able to say, well, Pastor Lauren, I can really say, yes, yes, I was mad at somebody today on the way to church. <laughs> well, the Bible says just don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with it. Amen. We're human beings. We have all kinds of emotions, all kinds of feelings, all kinds of things that go through our lives and experiences. But the issue is, will you be willing to deal with it and deal with it God's way, not your way? All right, that'll be 375, sir. How much? I said that'll be 375. Oh, you must be thinking about just the popcorn. How much is everything? No, that covers all of it. Really? The Mount Zion Cinema offers you an affordable night out at the movies. For a list of all upcoming movies and showtimes, visit us at mountzion.org. So, babe, you seem to be enjoying the movie. Yeah, I just can't believe how little I paid for all this. I'm going to go and get some more popcorn. When does a latte become the remedy for a long day? Or a booth, the gathering place for old friends? When can a class provide answers to life's hardest questions? It happens when a place becomes committed to improving the most important thing in your life, you. The District, just one mile north of Great Lakes Crossing, where life happens better. I become born again, and my choice must be now I'm going to live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. The New Testament, as you read the reading, writings of Jesus Christ, were about motivation. Now, this is what I love about God. When our motivation is right, how many know the Lord can certainly put up with our mistakes? Anybody out there make mistakes? I'm really glad the Lord can understand those things. But the scripture I read in Hebrews also talked about falling short of the grace of God. In other words, God's grace comes to us and gives us an opportunity for so many things, but we can fall short if we don't fully appropriate that grace on an ongoing basis. The love of the Spirit in life that Christ has for me gives us life. That's what I love about the Lord. He makes you alive and he gives you the abundant life. How many glad for abundance that God wants to give to all of us? Amen. Now, one of the ways we could talk about this, last week I shared a scripture that says, oftentimes the children of the world are more wise in their generation than the children of light. And what that means to me is literally, sometimes we are not very practical in our understanding of life. If you had a relationship with Jesus Christ and you say, oh, I love the Lord, and it has no reflection upon your life because there's nothing happening in your life that makes you want to respond or be pleasing to him, there's something wrong. Why? Because the Bible talks about our relationship that we're supposed to have with him. See, the change from the Old Testament to the New Testament wasn't a change from the law to grace. That is a part of the description. It was about relationship. You know, in the Old Testament, he said, in the Old Covenant, you were servants or slaves. But in the new covenant, I want to make you a son. 
Many people have a misunderstanding about God and how we deal with him. We see God as this distant figure in the sky, and one day he created heaven. It was a wonderful place. And the other day he created hell and said, I'm going to have a nasty place too. And then I'm going to kind of give people this obstacle course. Some of them will end up in heaven. Some of them will end up in hell. And then in the New Testament, he said, okay, I'm going to make it easy. Fewer obstacles so they can have more direct line to heaven. That's really the way people think about God. That isn't what God said. In the beginning, God created man. He said, I'm going to create someone who's going to be in my image and likeness. They're going to be my sons in the earth, says the mighty God. And I'm going to have a relationship with him. I'm going to have a relationship that's going to empower them, and I'm going to share my world with them. How many know God has a wonderful plan for his people? And another way he describes it is we are the bride of Christ, individually the sons of God, collectively the bride of Christ. When we have a relationship like that, I think it's pretty easy to understand there will be expectations along the way. If you're married or you have been married, you understand marriage has expectations of the other person. I mean, you know, if you're in a marriage where it's all one-sided, that's going to get old. There has to be two sides to it. That's the practical way we look at God. God wants a relationship. He has expectations of us, and he also lets us have expectations of him. Isn't that wonderful? And, and this is one of the areas we could describe how the church was wrong. When I was a kid, real small, you very rarely heard about one of the neighbors getting a divorce, but as I was getting older, this person was getting divorced, that person was getting divorced. It was a part of our society that the divorce rate was expanding just very, very quickly. Now, the church began to understand this isn't good, and so we were in churches preaching against divorce, preaching against divorce, preaching against divorce, and what happened is, in the church, there was no difference in the statistics between the people who were in the church, outside the church, even though people were told every week, you can't do that, and if you're going to do that, you can't be in the church, you can't be in the ministry, you can't do this, you can't do that. Why didn't it work? Well, if you read the scripture, and find out God's not just against divorce. How many know he's for marriage? And when people get married, how many know they have expectations? There's something inside that you're looking for. Not always right, not always good, but there's a craving inside because God ordained this and he wants you to have an experience and when it's not there, you're not going to be able to handle it in the end and that's why the law of thou shalt not get a divorce isn't going to work, but the law of life in Christ Jesus, which is, do you know you could have a marriage that actually could be fulfilling? That's a revelation for some, amen? Do you know that I gave this to you for blessing? That's why we have these classes on marriage, and like I said, the other classes, because there is an enrichment to life that one can have if we open up ourselves. And if we just try to use the law to regulate things, it's not going to work. Why? Because in the end, people are going to be looking for something, looking for that satisfaction, and a hungry people will keep on looking. Why? Because there is no satisfaction. That's why we need to know that God can be our satisfaction. Amen. He can be the source of our supply and blessing, but also he has given us a life that makes that possible. Upon her head, a planted hive of straw, which fortified her visage from the sun. Where on the thought might think, sometime it saw the carcass of beauty, spent and done. Life is a performance. Do it well. For more information on our theater program, go to mountzionarts.org. If you enjoy dancing, be sure to check out Mount Zion's School of Performing Arts. From hip hop to ballet, we have it all. And starting as early as ages three, up through adult. Whether you're a beginner or advanced, we have something for you. So check us out online at mountzionarts.org. So he says, this is what I want to have with you. Now, this is important about the relationship side, because when Jesus was talking about 
the people on Judgment Day. He said, depart from me, you who work for iniquity. Why? Because I never knew you. Now, I want to emphasize that because as Christians, we always want people to know who Jesus is. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know he could be your personal Savior? But in this story, in the illustration that Jesus is speaking, he's saying, I never knew you. Now, this is a very important observation for us to know because God wants to have an intimate relationship with us. And so when we talk about knowing Christ, that's absolutely true, but he also wants us to realize he wants to know us. Now, I know God is all-knowing. God created us, so in that sense, God knows us. But in the Bible, the word know, especially in the New Testament, where it says an Adam knew Eve and she had a child, it has an implication of intimacy of relationship. And that seems far-fetched to most people, but God actually wants to have that with us as a father to a son and as all of us as being what? The bride of Christ. And the principle of intimacy is based upon a very important concept. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is what often is referred to as the love chapter. And one of the things that it says here, it says, and now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now, this is talking about our relationship with God. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Hmm, that's a very interesting observation. I shall know just as I'm also known. Because why intimacy requires not just a desire to know the other people, but allowing of that person to get to know us. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Why is it so necessary that... Jesus would say, well, I want also to know you. Well, if there's not a reciprocal relationship of intimacy, what happens is we're always placing on the other person our own expectation of what we want them to be or who we think they should be. That's why I often hear even in secular media, they'll talk about Jesus and they'll ask people their opinion about Jesus. And people say a lot of things about Jesus that are not even in the Bible at all. Why is that possible? Because oftentimes we have an image of Jesus based upon our own expectations. We say we know him, but because we've never opened up ourselves in a reciprocal way, we really don't know who he is because we put our own expectations upon him. One way we can, I could share this with you kind of relates to what I said last week. When I was a kid growing up, I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior at a very young age. And uh, my mom used to read Bible stories to me out of a family Bible. She got it for her birthday back in 1963. I now have the Bible because I used to always love the stories, and so now I have it, and uh, those stories help me know who Jesus is. Now, in the Bible, there's actually a picture of Jesus Christ, and there's a painting. And uh, next to the painting, there is a description that is supposedly a historical record that somebody had, and they're describing Jesus, and it's in the picture. Now, if as I'm older and I look at it, I know it's not true because, of course, they made a gorgeous Jesus. How many know what a gorgeous Jesus is? Different than the one in the Bible who's, where it says, and he will have no form or comeliness or beauty that we would desire him. So he had long, flowing, chestnut-colored hair, Big blue eyes, kind of like Jeffrey Hunter in the old movie. You might have saw it in the long time ago or rented an old movie. It, the Jeffrey Hunter Jesus is so good looking. You're like, wow, that's really a good looking guy. And it, he had a course of flowing beer. And, and uh, that was Jesus to me. And I remember reading stories or hearing other people or, or hearing about churches that have their own Jesus, different countries to go to, different nationalities. They all have a different Jesus. And I'm like, wait a second. Jesus don't look like that. I have the picture of Jesus from the Bible. <laughs> of course, if he grew up in the Middle East, he's going to have blue eyes. Amen? <laughs> Long, flowing, chestnut-colored hair. How I many know we all want Jesus to look like us? That's the first hint. There's a problem here. <laughs> because... Just like it is in that way, it is also uh, the way we do it in the spiritual. And that's why we have to be very careful to understand, don't try to make the Jesus that fits your code, if you would. 
Now, like I was mentioning, last week in the 60s, they had the hippie movement, counterculture movement, and all of a sudden, young people started dressing just like Jesus. They started letting their hair grow out, and they were growing beards. Of course, if you're a teenager, it's a pretty scraggly thing, but they were trying, wearing the clothes that Jesus was wearing. It was an amazing. Like, they all studied the Bible like I did in the kid, and they're like, one day I want to be like Jesus. That'll be 375, sir. How much? I said that'll be 375. Oh, you must be thinking about just the popcorn. How much is everything? No, that covers all of it. Really? The Mount Zion Cinema offers you an affordable night out at the movies. For a list of all upcoming movies and showtimes, visit us at mountzion.org. So, babe, you seem to be enjoying the movie. Yeah, I just can't believe how little I paid for all this. I'm gonna go and get some more popcorn. Well, the problem is most Christians absolutely would have nothing to do with that Jesus. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because back in those days, if somebody came to church looking like Jesus, we'd know right away they were a sinner and need to be saved. Most of the time, wouldn't even let them in the church. How can you dress like that and, and think you're a Christian? Well, I look like Jesus. Well, not exactly. Besides that, well, Jesus didn't have a razor blade, so he couldn't have shaved. So he has an excuse for looking like that. And I even actually heard preachers preach messages that, you know, the pictures show Jesus with long hair, but he really had short hair. Heard another preacher say, well, you know, he, he had what seemed like long hair to us, but actually it was short for his day. I used to work at a grocery store as the styles were just starting to change. And back then, even when you worked somewhere, they were like, you know, you couldn't wear your hair over your ears. So you had to not cover your ears. And so we were all, us young guys at the grocery store, we wanted to be stylish. So we would grow our hair over our ears and then go to work and we would just paste it back with some green sticky stuff and hold it back, you know. And then we would look real clean cut during the day. And then at the end of the day, we'd let our hair down. <laughs> over the ears. I never was a wild hippie, as you may have guessed. I just, just wanted to cover my ears. Sometimes the styles kind of fit your look, amen? You're like, I need to cover these ears in Jesus' name. Bring that style back. So anyway, there was a big crisis going on in the country about that, and it was both in the secular and in the church. There was a song that came out back then. Some of you might remember it. It says, and the sign said, long-haired, freaky people. Come on, go ahead and sing. I know you want to. Needing all to fly. So I tucked my hair up under my hat, and I went in to ask him why. He said, you look like a fine, upstanding young man. I think you'll do. So I took off my hat and said, imagine that, me working for you. Some of you remember it. I can tell by your singing. Well, that happened a lot far, faster outside the church than in the church. But there was a whole Jesus people movement. That's a whole other story altogether. But it's really funny to me, like, we have our perception of Jesus, and, and we can have historical records, and we can say all kinds of things. But when Jesus starts looking different than we want, we're like, oh, no. Jesus said, will you let me be who I am? That's why that scripture I just read talked about how we have to have faith and hope and ultimately, love. Putting it in a marriage context, how many of you know it takes a lot of faith to get married? Amen. Once you make that commitment, wow, it's different. It was in the news this past week, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, you know, they were, for many years, they said, oh, what's a piece of paper? We're not going to get married. They adopted kids, had kids. I don't know what, they have a big family. And uh, finally, they got married. And somebody was interviewing her this week, and she said, you know what? It is different when you get married. 
something happens. All of a sudden, you quit pretending you're like the person they want you to be, amen? It's all of a sudden like, hey, I never did like going there, and I'm not going there again. <laughs> well, so you get married with all kinds of faith, then you have all kinds of hope and expectation, and most of that hope and expectation is that other person's going to be just exactly like I want them to be. Ah, oh, I got married so you could be everything I want you to be. I got married so you could be everything I want you to be. Uh-oh, now what are we going to do? <laughs> We're married. We have a covenant. We're committed to each other. We're going to keep on working through this thing. Amen? So what is it going to lead to? Is it going to lead? Now, is, when it says finally love, is it talking about that excited love? Like, oh, flutters. Oh, I'm in love. It's talking about love that is what we would call the fruit of the Spirit. Something that's a love that's a little different. Read what this next verse of Scripture says with me. Love suffers long. A couple out there just said, oh my God, we are in love. <laughs> <laughs> love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not ha behave rudely. And read this part with me does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. There's that word believes for faith. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And what does the last part say? See, that's the kind of love that it doesn't always tickle the fancy, so to speak. Doesn't always give you those flutters that you once had. But it's the love that comes when two people commit themselves over the long haul, and they don't spend 50 years fighting with each other. <laughs> you know, some people stay the same for all those years. It's never going to ever change. It's like the woman, she was married to her husband for 50 years. He passed away, and at the funeral, the pastor comes up and says, Honey, don't cry. You'll be back together again. She goes, Please don't tell me that. 50 years was plenty of time. But how do you know when we allow ourselves to be exposed, if you would, and we have that reciprocal intimacy that endures, all of a sudden you find yourself adjusting, adapting, and committed in a way that you never could have before. And that's the kind of re love relationship that God himself wants with each and every one of us. And when we have that relationship with him, it won't be a law that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. It'll be so natural and so normal. And the body of Christ would come to a place of blessing like the world would be jealous of it. And we would have harmony among us. Why? Because we've learned what love is. God has anointed Pastor Lauren to reach the church with a fresh message for this day. If you would like further information, we also invite you to visit us on the web at mountzion.org where you can hear more of Pastor Lauren's messages and find out about our ministries. If you're visiting the Metro Detroit area, we invite you to worship with us at Mount Zion Church. Thanks again for watching.